A quick disclaimer about this episode of Attack of the Killer Podcast. This week's show, we are talking about horror movies featuring big cats. Out of interest of our listeners' sanity, we will try our best not to make references to the Tiger King. We will take all of our willpower, and it may cause a lot of mental strain on the crew here at Attack of the Killer Podcast. This may be very difficult in these trying times since Tiger King 2 is now on Netflix. If a Tiger King reference does happen to take place, we apologize in advance. And if it does take place, it's not our fault. It was that bitch Carol Baskin's fault. Big Cat Horror Films on this episode of Attack of the Killer Podcast. Attention planet Earth and beyond. Stay tuned for Attack of the Killer Hello, all you cool cats and kittens. God damn it. I did it already. Five <laughs> seconds in and I've already ruined it. <sighs> uh-huh. Welcome, everyone, to Attack of the Killer podcast. This is episode 248 called Big Cats. We will be talking about horror movies featuring those monstrous man-eating felines, you know, like lions, tigers, panthers, cheetahs, Persians. If this is your first time listening to Attack of the Killer Podcast, let me explain what our show is all about. Attack of the Killer Podcast is a horror movie podcast where a group of friends, we get together, we pick a topic, and we discuss films within that topic. Now, we're all just friends here on the show, and our discussion is completely open and free, so there may be spoilers. Don't say I didn't warn you. I do want to take a moment to give a very special shout out to our newest attacker, Kenny Walsinger. Kenny! Kenny has recently joined the Video Nasties tier and gets all the awesome perks, including a shout-out on the show. Kenny, you're awesome! (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for supporting the show! That's your shout-out. You too can get shout outs on the show and support the show <laughs> by going to jointheattackers.com and become an attacker today. An attacker are those who get all kinds of extra killer podcast content for supporting the show. You can get bonus episodes so you can hear AOTKP once a week and not, but not only that, but you get the regular episodes early. Unlike those normies, and you could spoil it for them because you get to hear it first. But that's not all. You can also get our video series like Video Updates, Insane Mike's Movie, Insane Mike's Women in Top Ten List, Killer Critiques. There are also all kinds of stuff that you can add to your physical Attack of the Killer podcast collection right there next to your Tad hair doll and the half-eaten hot dog that was thrown away by Jason and that vial of sweat from Andy. You can get your own membership card, certificate, and sticker. There's also Mikey's Monsters, where I draw you as a monster of my choice. You can also get your own Attack of the Killer podcast t-shirt. You can get all that awesome stuff and more. Uh, or pick the content that best suits you by going to jointheattackers.com. Pick the tier you desire and get all the stuff that you want. That's jointheattackers.com. And now it's time to introduce you to the podcast crew. Filled with arrogance, he walked up to a bunch of lions and told them how much better he was than them. He was consumed by pride. Jason, everybody. <laughs> you and your puns, you silly goose. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for listening. He always wanted to sing a, he always wanted to sing the song A Lion Sleeps Tonight. You may say his urge is a whim away, a whim away, a whim away. Tad everybody. Hey guys, and I just wanted to point out, um, Mike. You know, I'm not, I'm not kink shaming, but I, I saw Brandy dresses. You know, the Tiger King, <laughs> and I, I think she might have accidentally created a new kink for you. <laughs> Sadly, I think you're right. It was kind of hot. 
<laughs> he was once asked on which side does a tiger have the most stripes, and he said, on the outside. Andy, everybody. <laughs> Meow. <laughs> <laughs> oh man what's up guys i miss you fellas yeah hey <laughs> it's gonna be a good show but i have a question for the listeners first oh you guys have shutter yet no and you call yourselves horror fans why haven't you signed up for the streaming service that was made for people like us Hours and hours of all things horror, from classic films to the si- from the silent era to the newest and 2021 films. Also, so much great like shows and original content. What the hell are you waiting for? A free month or something? Well, fine. Your wait is over. Get a month of Shutter for free of your fav- from your favorite podcast. Us here at Attack of the Killer Podcast. Just enter our promo code A O T K P. What's that spell out? <laughs> <laughs> and get your first month free. Hey, <laughs> silent. Oh, oh yeah. Start Sound like I was in the the, uh, the dark lodge, the black lodge. Out. <laughs> <laughs> Where was I? Start your journey through the horror streaming channel Shutter. Again, that promo code is out. <laughs> The birds uh, sing a pretty song. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, there is so much to watch on Shudder. And speaking of watching stuff, here's Tad with what we watched. What we watched. Well, guys, since we last recorded... Something major happened, and it's a Halloween. Halloween happened. Yay! Well, Yay. yeah, since we last... And I assume, like, um, our readers, and I assume most of you guys, like me, sort of binge in, in horror right around this time of year. And, of course, we do year-round, but it's something about this time of year where uh, something's in the air, and you just got to watch as much as you can. So I'm just going to skip right in front of everyone, because... <laughs> I have seen a ton of news, and I'm only going to list stuff that I watched for the first time um, because I decided this year I was just going to binge and and polish off a lot of these movies that have been sitting around. So, um, And I I won't go too long, but I watched uh, from 1946, The Spiral Staircase, an old black and white creepy uh, movie. I really, really enjoyed that. It was perfect Halloween type movie. Um, I watched Lady in White. Have you guys seen that before? It's a no. Lucas Haas, Lucas Haas movie, or uh, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Like, it, it, there's never been a movie. I don't know, man. It's right up there with like something Wicked This Way comes that really brings that Halloween it, nostalgia. It's yeah, it's it's it's, it's yeah, it's they're kind of similar movies, right? Just kids right. are in trouble. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen that. Like, I was probably Lucas Haas's age <laughs> when I saw that. Yeah, I definitely the, the, recommend this for Halloween time. Like, it's it's set in the I think mid fifties or early sixties mm. uh, and there is set during Halloween. So seeing all those old vintage Ben Cooper masks and costumes and oh, cool. uh, the cars and stuff, just really, really cool. Um, I watched for the first time, the watcher in the woods. I picked up the Blu-ray from Disney movie club. That was really cool. Had a young, um, Oh, what's her name? Uh, Kyle Richards from uh, Halloween, Halloween kills. Oh, uh, another sort of it's like one of the two creepy Disney movies like they did like kids horror movies. This and something wicked this way comes uh, this is sort of like the sister film. And it was really cool, really good. Um, and then for first time podcast with Mr. Attacker, Brian Godsell, I uh, w- we checked out the Giallo film. What have you done to Solange? Yeah, I just <laughs> listened to that episode today, by the way. It was yeah, awesome. Well, thank you. That was a fun. I, I would hate to say a deep cut because uh, the uh, theme of the movie, but um, that would be taking one of Mike's <laughs> puns. Uh, and then I saw two brand new horror movies in theaters that I recommend to everyone. Antlers was fucking awesome. Mm. Um, produced by uh, Guillermo del Toro. Uh, fantastic creature design. A dark, gloomy, sad movie. Not one second of joy in that one, but uh, was great theater experience. And then 
Edgar Wright went full horror and did Last Night in Soho, and it was really, really fucking good. For, as far as I'm concerned, Edgar Wright has yet to make a bad film. Not even like he hasn't even made like a, a good film. He's made nothing but great films. Uh, so I second that opinion. Yeah. So ch- so check out Last Night Hard in to argue Soho. With that. Yeah. And then the last one that I will mention was Censor, which I also saw Andy has watched at yeah. some point. Uh, really cool about this girl who is a censor in the UK watching the video nasties and basically has to pass or take notes on these movies and make sure that things, you know, she's a censor. So things have to get past her and okayed by her. Um, and then one day a movie arrives and she's convinced that it is the story of her childhood and her long lost sister who went missing when they were seven is in this movie. So she huh. goes f- to try to find the director and, um, it's really cool. It's d- written, directed by, um, I always screw up her name. So I'm going to actually click Prano? and make sure Prano Bailey bond. Yeah. Um, and she had a, f- she's had a film, uh, one or two films, shorts in a uh, snake alley festival film. And, uh, it's just really, really cool to see like short directors go on and get their big shot. And, and this one's going over well in the uh, horror community. So it's, it's on good. Hulu now. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so I highly rec- recommend that one too. So um, yeah, I watched a whole lot. So that's what I've watched since the last time we recorded. Andy, what have you watched? Oh boy. Um, first of all, I, I kind of, I went on a, a tear of newer movies as well. Uh, let's see which ones I watched the unholy with Jeffrey Dean Riddick. And I didn't know that it also had uh, Carrie El- Elwes. I, I could never say his last name right. Uh, From Princess Bride? Yeah. Yeah. He, and he's Saw. in it. Yes. And there was another. Uh, oh, uh, William Sadler is hmm. also, is oh. also oh, in nice. it. So, I mean, it's got good horror pedigree, but I mean, it's 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 like religious horror a little bit. Uh, it's not it's not bad, but I was left. It was it was to me, it was underwhelming uh it, it it's okay um i also watched all three of the fear, fear street films and i love them i was a little yeah. uh, i was a little apprehensive going in because i was just like okay this is rl stein you know it's just like these are these were books made for teenagers and i i figured it was just going to be it was going to be like lukewarm but i mean it turns out these teenagers talk like actual teenagers they will tell you to go fuck yourself and like i'm gonna <laughs> fucking kill you these movies so are so much like, fun man yes yes and i had a blast i couldn't wait to watch the next one right after the next one so mm-hmm. i was just like i really really enjoyed those um really really great uh storytelling in the, in those as well um i also watched vhs 94 and god Damn it, do I love this movie. Oh man. I'm like it, man. waiting for the right moment to watch it. I've been One of dying these... to watch it. So but... cool, right? Oh my oh dear lord. I I, I don't want to give anything away. I just I want you guys to just sit down and watch this movie. Because there is one segment, particularly one, and the only thing I say that it's uh it's an it's an Asian uh, uh part of part of the film. It I if they made this into a live, a, you know, a, like uh, just a whole movie, I would definitely sit down and watch it because it is it is just absolutely stellar. There is uh, there isn't a weak um, segment in this movie at all. It is just awesome. Um, if I would say the the weakest one would probably be the first one. And I think the first story is actually pretty damn stellar. I was gonna say so, I thought that was the strongest, and I thought the really? Asian one was the weakest. So really, really, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean the the I mean I think they're all good. Um, the uh, the last one with these idiot rednecks. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, oh. Um. Anyway, VHS ninety four, totally awesome. Very much recommend that one. And I also got in Don't Breathe two. Um, yeah, it's hard to, uh, sympathize with a rapist. Yes. Yes. And it, it, the thing is, I think what they were trying to say is just like, he wasn't like, a 
He's not a rapist. I mean, he's definitely guilty of sexual assault. There's no getting around that whatsoever. He's not, but he's not a rapist in like the traditional sense where he's like in a dark alley with a knife and he's just this slobbering, you know, s- sexual deviant. Right. He's just using a turkey baser on on the yes. Girls. Yes, yes. So, I mean, but it's still... <laughs> Way it's different. Fucking, Way different. It, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> fucking deplorable. Yeah. But, I mean, I and I think that's what their frame of mind was when they were trying to redeem him. He's just like, he's not like, you know, dragging a girl into an alley or anything, you know. Well, I don't know. I don't know what they were going for. But, I mean, I, I liked what they, what, they, what they tried to do. But, I mean, I'm glad the fact they, they ended it with the way that they did i don't think this should be like fucking death wish where they have to make six of them and they you know try to make him some sort of lovable character but uh yeah i can't think of other than that i mean i always watch um halloween on halloween and of course i cracked open the uh the shout factory 4k and it's gorgeous i can see of every freaking you know striation in the pumpkin when at the beginning of the movie <laughs> and it's just so it looks so good carpenter's cigarette smoke looks great when you're not supposed to <laughs> see it and the extra standing in the background he looks awesome but <laughs> i was yeah i was really blown away by the transfer on halloween 4 because i i popped in I Blu-ray that, that then watched the 4k and i'm like that opening sequence outside with the you know the midwest sort of yeah um, yeah that opening is just gorgeous yeah. check it out but anyway, yeah, that's what I watched. Watch VHS 94, people. It's awesome. Yes, I agree. So, Mike, what have you watched? Okay, well, I'll get my my Halloween weekend viewing um, list out of the way real quick because I, I feel like you got to mention that stuff, right? Um, so, like, I watched – I wanted to watch something classic, so I watched Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, which then inspired me to watch immediately after that Freddy vs. Jason. So – Watch those. Uh, Halloween night after trick or treating, Simon and I we watched Freaky and Poltergeist. Yes, I love. I was going to mention, dude. Like Simon watching horror movies. I know. Oh, it, yeah. I, I, I'm just so. I'm just so happy. You know, uh, Papa. <laughs> the worst. The worst part of it is just like it feels like now we don't have the time to watch all this stuff as opposed to like before when it's like well, we're watching all this stuff, but you won't, but you won't watch horror movies now. Now he's watching horror movies and we don't have time to sit down and watch them all. But anyway, and he loved them. He loved them both. Um, he felt Poltergeist was a little bit of a stretch, yeah, you know, and it is. But um, and then also like as I'm doing my traditional Halloween, making a feast, I had Tear in the Isles playing, which is awesome. Really good. Really good for the Halloween vibes. Anyway, so that, those are just the, the the stuff I watched Halloween weekend. Um, the stuff I really wanted to talk about for this episode is a new f- movie I watched from 2018, uh, a mockumentary slash found footage film called Butterfly Kisses, uh, directed by Eric uh, Christopher Myers. So it's a kind of a, it's again it's like a mockumentary and found footage movie. Uh, it's about this uh, filmmaker who discovers a box of videotapes uh, that uh, has two students. Um, uh, has their disturbing little film project, which features a local, uh, local horror legend called the peeping Tom that, a, you know, if you stare down this, uh, this tunnel, um, you know, for at a certain time, you know, for a certain period of time, the peeping Tom will appear and you have to stare down there without blinking. <clears throat> And so this filmmaker finds these tapes of of these uh, of these filmmakers trying to, um, you know, prove the the legend. Um, so he starts editing the tapes together to set out to prove that everything is real, all this is real, the tapes are real, and make it make the work his own. But things go from bad to worse for this guy. Um, all the while, there's a, a film crew following him around throughout this project. It's a cool little found footage. I I, I dig the lore that they were building. Um, it was pretty neat because uh, basically, uh, when you every time you like, if you are staring down this and and you see him, every time you blink after that, he gets closer and closer to you until he kills you. 
Um, so like, you know, the, the legend is, is like, you, you, you go mad with trying to not blink. Um, you know, but these filmmakers figured out a loophole of filming, filming it instead of actually witnessing it. And the camera becomes like the eye. And so every time they shut off the camera and they turn the camera back on, the peeping Tom creature is, is closer. So it's, it's all through the camera lens, which I thought was really neat. So it's it's a cool little uh, um, unknown found footage uh, mockumentary film. I would highly recommend checking out. Last thing I want to bring up is um, uh, Brandy and I uh, got the urge to purge, so we had a, a purge marathon. Um, we watched uh, all five purge movies back to back, not in one night, but like you know. Uh, and we also watched this, uh, first season of the, of the TV show. So we, we started the second season, got like the first episode out of, uh, uh, into that. Um, and man, I love this franchise and it's really cool. It was really cool watching one right after another where each film is, you know, fresh in your head. So, uh, this is the first time I'd seen the forever purge. So I, I liked, I liked how, you know, we built up to finally getting to see the new one. Um, cause there's a lot of things I picked up this time. Um, like I, I don't know why I never noticed this before, but, uh, the actor Edwin Hodge, uh, he's the guy in the first movie that, um, the little boy saves from the, from the yuppies. Um, and the, you know, that what causes all the mayhem for that family that night. Um, he turns out, uh, he doesn't get a, he actually shows up in the second movie and in the third movie as the same character. And you don't get to know his character name till he gets to the third movie where he's basic. He's basically the leader of the anti purge movement, um, in the third movie, you know, his character evolves from the first film basically his life getting saved by this family, which then like evolves into him becoming part of this movement movement. And you see him in the second movie, by the time you get to the third movie, he's full on in charge of this section of the anti purge movement. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, you know, I like, you know, the idea of this franchise and this world building with like more smaller characters in the background, having character development and growth that, you know, you don't always pick up on. I thought, I think that's neat. Um, I was gonna say, I have two questions. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you watch them in order they were released or chronological order? Cause we have a prequel. This is true. No, we watched them in, in um, release order, not chronological. And then the other one, what did you think of the new one? I liked it. Um, I really, really liked it too, but I, I didn't Jason, right? You didn't like it. It was, uh, it's all right. I, I okay. liked it better than the first purge. Um, the first purge is probably my least favorite of the whole series. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and I was a little hesitant when things were starting off with the Forever Purge because it didn't feel like a purge movie at first. Right, the trailers made me think like I'm gonna hate this. I hate sort of the Western feel to it. I'm yeah. like, but yeah, I, I ended up really liking it. Yeah, and again, I also feel like you know part of the thing that I liked about the Forever Purge is is watching each of these films back to back like this because. You watch it with those first three films and then jumping to Forever Purge. As the purge goes on in the the history of this universe, um, it gets it gets darker and darker and people get more and more evil and like sinister and creative. Like the purge gets worse and worse every film to the point where you get to the Forever Purge and they just decide to stop purging. That or they not to not to stop purging, where they just continue on, and it just totally ruins everything. And I thought that was really neat. So I really, I really did dig the the Forever Purge. I thought it was awesome. Anyway, so that's what I watched. I guess that leaves you, Jason. What have you watched? Well, uh, I just want to, you know, I love this time of year. I definitely just want to pimp it out again, or or you know, give a. A commercial for the, the we know the upcoming year end episode is is on its way. We're all uh, trying to get in as many uh, 2021 horror films as possible, and that, and that's what's so great about this. I'm actually gonna skip all of mine that I've been watching, but there's just one I I want to finally talk about that I finally saw, and I'm so happy and excited about it. I finally saw the Green Knight. Yeah, what'd you think, dude? 
here's the thing. I loved it, obviously, yeah. for so many. So, yes, A24, yes. But, like, it's it. I love fantasy films. So there's this guy on a quest, you know, and it's a fairy tale. But it's dark as all get out. That's Mike's phrase. And <laughs> and so it's just it's just awesome. Yeah, hitting all the right notes. For it you. is. It really is. I mean, uh, it's. I mean, the Lord of the Rings is just one of my favorite films of all time. And so, like, this is just the dark, 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 dark cousin of that. Uh, I, I'll be honest. I I watched that trailer so many times, and and like maybe I watched it too many times because uh, I felt like it was gonna be more. W- wicked and dark and the those those and like uh fucked up a 24 ness i mean it's in there for sure but like you know it was it was more on the i don't mean this in a bad way but just that i I'll evenly paced it wasn't slow it was uh just a, a nice i loved almost- it minimalistic in a yeah. way i mean there's there's a scene where he's just r- slowly riding a horse down a trail yep. in the middle of like these big mountains and it's just that's oh, the camera just follows him doing that for a good five minutes yep there's some big uh camera shots that there's that big panning Gorgeous. uh circle shot where he you know and uh so it's beautiful it's gorgeous it's dark it's fantasy it's a fairy tale good guys versus bad guys and and uh and a quest to kings and queens and knights and oh man it's so i loved it i I think it was saturday last saturday i was at a halloween party and uh you know we we did our uh midsummer costume and someone was like oh man speaking of a24 like i think i saw the worst movie i've ever seen in my (laughs) life uh you know they're like the green knight and i'm like oh i loved it and they're like there's no way like anybody actually likes that. They're just saying that because they want to be cool and edgy. And I'm like, okay, like cool, bro. I'll talk to you later. Yep. But yeah, and then obviously Dev Patel is just great. He's captivating and he's easy to watch and he's amazing in this and and Joel Edgerton. I find myself loving everything he's in. He can. I mean, he's kind of the same guy, but then he's always different guys, and he's just so fun to watch and entertaining yeah that's so that's what i watched loved it i think that's it because i spoke my piece at the beginning Mm -hmm. because i had that huge list so that's Mm -hmm. what we all watched Mm -hmm. awesome well thank you guys and now it's time to get your tweets on here's (laughs) jason with pole position from now on like your parents were you are the secret force of pole position all right, so that's how you do it. You get your tweets on. Got it. Now I know. And now you all know how to work your Twitters. Mm-hmm. But today, on today's poll position, oh, man, we got a really fun one here. Uh, the question is, what is the best animal attack subgenre? What is your favorite killer animal type? And St. Mike, you're up first. Oh, man. Well, this was... Uh... This was tough because uh, Animal Attack uh, movies, I love them. I love all of them. I can't think of a a type of Animal Attack movie that I don't like. You know, I'll, I'll even yep. watch Slugs. Um, but I went, <laughs> I went with Rats. I think Rats is probably there's there's I th- I think they're probably some of the creepiest um, Animal Attack films come from you know just i don't know there's just something something nasty and sinister and spooky and about about rats in in horror films you got great movies like um careful with your words (laughs) great (laughs) does this have anything to do with my list uh on slack okay i already know what your list is (laughs) damn it uh graveyard shift which is great you got giant ramps in that one you got willard you got ben Deadly Eyes, and in my opinion, one of the most underrated 
animal attack movies of all time. I'm not going to say Rat's Night of Terror. Oh, I just said it. You just did. Um, no, I'm actually talking about Of Unknown Origin. Yeah, that's good. Which is a great movie. One, a, one man versus one rat through a, an entire hour and a half, and it's amazing. <laughs> anyway, so that's the right answer. What? <laughs> Well, that's too bad because I actually have the best answer and the right answer, and I can actually name good movies. I, <laughs> uh, uh, my for my pick, I picked uh fish, fishies, uh, or sharks or things like that. So, your underwater monster guys, your fishes. So obviously, Jaws. Oh my God, one of the greatest films of all time. We got Piranha. We got the Meg. We got Forty Seven Meters Down. We got Orca. There's so many guys. Two-headed yeah. shark attack. No, no. There's also a shit ton of shitty, shitty, Sharknado. shitty shark. Sharknado. I, I was trying to get out of this without having to say that. Dick shark. Uh, <laughs> toxic shark. What? There's one for this year. I forgot what it was already. Um, Frankenfish. Virus, virus shark, shark. Which I out. plan on watching. Don't just do it. Because you put it on Don't. the 2021 list. But anyway, so... Yeah, you know them creatures under the sea, man. Like Tad says, we're supposed to be on land and stay out of the water. That's mine. Tad, what, what's your favorite, and what do you think is the best animal attack subgenre? Well, mine is sort of, um, I might be even cheating a little bit. I was saying, uh-huh. like, apes and monkeys, but, like, in my mind, uh-huh. I was thinking, you no, know, like, Planet of the Apes. Yeah. Like, they evolve and, and get too smart for us. They're not even necessarily attacking. They're just fucking taking over. <laughs> Like to me that, you know, the, yeah. the new Planet of the Apes movies are, are so cool just because it's like almost believable. You know, the, yeah. they're, they're closest thing to us are like, I, I find, how could this not happen? <laughs> yeah. I find them so, um, mesmerizing, like watching yeah. and, and not just the movies, but actual apes and monkeys. Like they're just so smart and just, they're like one degree away from us. It's, it's almost terrifying. And like project uh, X, yeah. remember that movie? No, nope. no. <laughs> Matthew, Matthew oh, Broderick yeah. is oh, yeah. teaching these apes how to fly planes and shit. Like I remember Congo. Games. Yeah, Congo is pretty bad. Stop um, eating my sesame cake. <laughs> your King Kongs, uh, your, of course. Yo, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it just there's there's all kinds of them, but I, I always my mind went right to like Planet of the Apes because to me it was so like good. pretty believable. So uh, that's my pick and the best pick. So all right, well, Andy, what's your What's your answer? My pick is obviously the best pick because <laughs> they that. they turn up in they turn up in freshwater, turn they turn up in the sewer. Yeah. So I mean you don't have to go to the jungle, you don't have to go to the fucking beach, you don't have to, you know, go looking for rats, you know, in your fucking house, all right? You know, so this is alligators and crocodile movies because they kick ass because the, when they kill you, they <laughs> grab you, they eat the shit out of you. Then they go into a barrel roll. Then they drown you while you're bleeding to death. Okay. Ugh. So, I mean, you've got alligators. So you've got the Lake Placid film. So you've got Eaten Alive. Mm-hmm. You've got Prime Evil. You've got Rogue. I mean. The pool. All these. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, alligator two, the mutation. Yeah. <laughs> um, crawl. <laughs> Don't forget crawl. Crawl. Yeah. yeah hell yeah. Um, so um, only like, what is it? Which one is it that does the roll thing? Only one between the gator and the. Uh, oh god. I, I, no, I'm not Steve Irwin. Um, I was going to say gator. right now. Um, I I guarantee it. Brian Clark screaming yeah, at his thanks. radio because he knows and he's he's going to correct us in the chat. Yeah. yeah, I think I, I, I'm going to – I got a 50-50 chance of him not killing me, so I'm going to say crocodile. <laughs> so. um, but, yeah, anyway, those those films are, are awesome, I think, the alligator and crocodile movies. So. Very nice, very nice. Well, all y'all get your butts over to Twitter, and the poll will be up, and get your votes in for who you think got it right, the best animal attack subgenre. And that is at AOTKP. That's right. And what did you say? How do you do it, Mike? Do your, Get your Twitters on. Get your Twitters on. Get your tweets on. Keep it PG. Oh, yes. All right. And that's that's pole position. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome, Mike. For, but forget about those animals. Oh. We're talking about big cat horror movies on this episode. Yeah, we are. So, Andy, what's our first film tonight? 
Okay, our first film comes to us from 2016, and it is called Uncaged. Four victims, then. Where is his arm? In the same place as his wife's head. <laughs> Impossible. Overbred Rottweilers, pit bulls. Not even close. What happened? They're agitated. Have been all day. You couldn't drag them outside for a walk. Th th that, th that's not thoughtful. Has anyone seen this lion? I can't confirm or deny it. What the hell is that? Amazing how one lion can stop an entire city. This isn't just a lion. The park has been evacuated and shut down, allegedly for cleaning. I know someone. He's tracked and killed dozens of lions. If anyone can get this lion, he can. Jack Delarue, reporting for duty. He's only got one leg. My God, he's a big fellow. The last thing I want is to turn Amsterdam into a hunting ground. Come to your daddy. Okay, going to radio silence. Okay. Uncaged, the zoo veterinarian gets caught up in a grisly adventure as she finds herself leading the citywide hunt for a monstrous lion terrorizing the Dutch capital of Amsterdam. Um okay. Um I got I got to be honest. Um I didn't think that I was going to like this movie when I first started watching it because it was so the start of it was so poorly dubbed. It's so poorly dubbed. Um but unbeknownst to me it really kind of started growing on me a little bit. But probably not the way that it intended because it was it's it's just it's it's hilarious to me. Um I love the fact that this this um this movie does not pull any punches. I mean, kids, you know, th th this 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 cat does not give a shit how old you are. I mean, it will <laughs> eat you and shit you out just very quickly. Um it had it had some great comedic moments, which uh, some I think were even unintentional, and I'll get to that later. But uh, th it had it had good gore. I mean, just people getting their arms and legs ripped off. Particularly, one thing that stood out to me is when the cat just gets in inside this um, uh, city bus, and he just rips this guy's back just straight off. I mean, just tears <laughs> his back. I was just like, oh shit. Um, the, the comedic moments, most of them come from like the, the incompetence of people trying to hunt this thing. Um, I didn't really, you know, I was just like, okay, this zoologist is, you know, she's got a boyfriend that's just an idiot. I was just like, okay, that I didn't even care if he lived or died. I mean, more power to him if he lived, but I was more interested in the way that they were trying to hunt this thing. Like, for instance, you know, the first, you know, uh, the first, you know, safari hunter who basically literally looked like the stereotypical, you know, Panama Jack, you know, Jumanji looking motherfucker, you know, <laughs> just like with the, with the hat and the, and the outfit and stuff. First of all, this guy swallows louder than anything on two or four feet. It'd be pretty easy to hunt his ass, which, you know, big surprise, he gets eaten anyway. <laughs> um, so, like, the, and his idiot kid falling into the bear traps, that was hilarious. But the, <laughs> the funniest... The funniest thing, which I think was unintentional, was the, the, the handicapped guy that was, like, the actual good hunter. Him with a rifle... Chasing him on him, uh, uh, chasing the lion on the motorized car <laughs> was the funniest damn thing of the movie. I thought that was so damn funny. Um, I didn't expect it to be as bloody as I thought it was going to be, 
which which was good um but yeah using human carcasses for bait that was interesting um but yeah overall uh i just think this this movie is uh it was a hell of a lot more goofy than i expected it to be which i think kind of saved it for me because i started i think i came into it taking it a little bit too seriously than i probably thought i should have and then i realized it was going more for laughs than it was for actual you know more most likely jump scares which is usually what you get in these kind of films but um yeah, I can say that I've watched it. Anyway, I'll shut up now. I'll hand it over to you guys. I mean, I had fun with this. Um, it's yeah, it was it was a fun maybe one time watch. Right. Uh, it's nothing nothing groundbreaking or anything. I you know it's it doesn't take itself serious enough to be horror, but it doesn't take itself not serious enough to be really very. It's got funny stuff in it. It's comical, but even the comedy sometimes kind of fell a little fell flat. flat. Yeah. They, I will agree the gore is cool, and uh, there's some fun ideas going on on there, too. I mean, I like the idea of using the brother-in-law's already dead corpse as bait, you know? Yep, he's dead already, yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was that was dark and pretty dark and humorous. Um, <clears throat> I think part of the problem... For me, well, one, you know, the CGI lion. Uh, yeah. You know, but whatever. Uh, I think deeper than that, I really had a hard time with, like, the two main characters. I mean, I liked the woman for the most part, but the fact that she's with this, like, womanizing asshole news reporter guy um, lessened my liking of her. Because I hated him, like he's just a he's just a scumbag, and I get what they're trying to do, but they missed the mark, I think completely at no point did I feel like he had any character arc to make me sympathize with this character whatsoever. I don't think he even needed to be in the goddamn movie well, it's true because I was way more interested in the relationship between the the weird wheelchair bound guy and the girl. The hunter, yeah. yeah, in their past, yeah. That that was probably my favorite scene, the funniest scene there. At when he's laying there dying, and she's like, "Is there anything I can do for you?" And he's like, asks her to strip naked, and she starts to do it. <laughs> and he's like, "I was just kidding." I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> and I, yeah. um, that was probably my favorite part, and and it's because I just liked that rapport between them two way better than her rapport with yeah. that with that other with her real boyfriend. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think they could have lost that guy, and it it would have gained a lot more points from me without having that character in there at all. Yeah, I think the, like Andy said, the dubbing really, really hurt it for me, where I just could not take it seriously. Uh, it, and it, this is more on me. I tried watching it, like, late one night, and I was like, man, I, I'm not feeling this, so I'll come back tomorrow. And then I came back the next day, and I'm like, I'm still not feeling this, but I got to get through it. So it took me, like, three or four times to get through it. Mm. Um, but it's just the dubbing is so hard to get over. And I don't – maybe is there, like, a subtitled version on somewhere, I'm sure? I would hope so, yeah. yeah. I don't but know. it just – the dubbing is it just ruins it for me, and that's a bummer because there's probably a fun movie somewhere in there, but it's just, like, it comes off as so corny because – it's so poorly done. Yeah. It may have a lot to do with it too, but I don't know. I mean, I'm watching this movie and the fact that it's set in Amsterdam and the way the dubbing is done, I was instantly reminded of like the lift and come to find out this is directed by Dick, uh, Dick Moss who, uh, directed the lift that we did for, Mm -hmm. um, a show while back. So yeah. And he also did Saint, which is a really cool, um, you know, Christmas horror movie. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I wasn't uh, in love with this, obviously, but I had I, I did have fun at some of the points. So it, it dragged at the beginning, but when they they bring in the hunter in the wheelchair, uh, I think that's where it picked up the pace, and it just went balls to the wall from there. So at least it was entertaining. Yeah. Where I felt like leading leading up to it, I did not care about these characters or development. I was like, right? They're, they're, I mean, there's a cool scene like when the lion gets in the bus. That's sort of cool. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. I know. I was like, fuck yeah, eat those kids. But um, <laughs> <laughs> other than that, yeah, I, I this is probably my least favorite of the uh, movies we watched. I, I mean, clearly the least favorite of the ones we watched for this podcast, but um, there's just better, better killer cat movies out there. Guys, you are crazy. This movie's fucking awesome. <laughs> I didn't say I Oh, I love it. No, I know. I'm way more on Andy's side and even more so. I, I love the hell out of it. I, I Maybe it was Tad uh, got me scared because he's like, it's taken me 14 times to watch this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. What has Mike done? Oh, no. He and set it, your bar so low. That must be it. But yeah, no, fuck. It was awesome. Like, you just you can't you fuck who cares about the CGI? It was it was fine. Yeah, it's, it's and fine. You, know, you can't go into you can't this have you can't go into Jurassic this movie Park. and think that you're gonna no. get you and know. it was better so, than you probably thought it was gonna be, even though it wasn't great all the time, but it was yeah, it so was fine. When I made that complaint, I was dismissive about it because I you know it's it didn't ruin the movie. It's just I I get what I get they have to do that, but at the same time, it's like it's not good. <laughs> no, but it, it's still, but it, it was better than you think it would be in a cheap, yeah, CGI of a man eating lion running around the city. That was way better than I thought it would be. And the dubbing, I fucking had so much fun with it. Like, right, sure, right at first, you're like, oh, this really isn't that good, but but it was also really fun. I don't know, it made it made it even more fun for me. Um, I, I liked all the guys that the main girl was awesome. The, the Jack in the wheelchair, he was hilarious. Um, best part of the movie is him. I, 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 yeah. Just, I just, I just loved, decided he's the best part. I loved that. It was like, it was, it was super fucking gory, mm-hmm. but it was also, there was a lot of comedy and it was like, yep. just was all over the place. And that made it really cool and interesting to me. So I don't know. I can't believe how much I liked it. That's the crazy part. Yeah, I'm kind of shocked, honestly. Yeah. So it it was it was awesome. I really liked it a lot. Well, cool. And it's on Prime, and it's also got a different name called Prey. Yeah, anytime you look this movie up, it, the title Prey instantly comes up. No matter you do, if you look it up on IMDb and you click on it, the title changes to Prey. The poster says Prey. You look it up on on the Roku to search for it. It'll come up as Prey anytime you type in Uncaged. But on but yeah, on Prime you can you can find it under Uncaged and just make sure it's the 2016 directed by Dick Moss. Yeah, I'm kind of wanting to explore more Dick Moss stuff because everything I've seen of his <laughs> Moss is way cooler than quick. Dick Warlock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what you find on uh, Sloth, Dick Moss. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, never mind. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't have a Dick Moss collection. I may start. Like, because you know the lift box was, set. The lift was cool. This isn't. This one wasn't. Wasn't. Wasn't too bad. And I like the. I like Saint. He a hesitated lot. so much saying that. It wasn't. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what? Wasn't too bad. I, had, I like. I said. I had fun with it. And I. I. I think I'm in the same boat as as Tad. Is like it definitely picked up the pace and everything once. Once. Uh, what's the character's name? Jack. 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 When Jack shows up. Oh, he was so funny. He yeah, he was the funniest part of the movie, and you know, and again, I just like the relationship between him and the girl way more than mm-hmm. I like the relationship between her and her actual boyfriend. Yep, good comedy, good gore, crazy, yep. Norwegian film. All right, so Jason, what's the next movie on our? Oh man, this next movie is awesome. It's from nineteen seventy seven. And it's called the it's called Day of the Animals. It's gonna be a rough trip. Are you big and bad enough to handle it? Although the effect on living organisms is not yet known, people are being advised to remain indoors whenever possible, especially those in high altitude areas where the sun's rays would be naturally stronger. Hello, dog. I told you that sun seemed damn peculiar today. Ah, 
God sent a plague down on us because we're just a bunch of no good fellas. Sure out of that, Sam. There's something strange in the woods, and I don't know what it is. I know these city folks sure wouldn't take much of panic. Damn it, Doc, get out of here! The depletion of the Earth's ozone layer causes animals above the altitude of 5,000 feet to begin attacking humans. A group of hikers led by Steve Buckner, played by the awesome Christopher George, are trapped in the military quarantine zone and must fight their way out. Directed by the amazing William Girdler. No, I'm not sure, Mike. I... Maybe mm-hmm. how much of this? How much is? How much do I love this movie because I love Grizzly that much? Like I think you I, honestly, I think <laughs> it has a lot to do with how much you love. Grizzly. Are these like? They're like sequel movies. They're like they're like partner movies. They kind of are. Um, and I've done William Girdler on Insane's Picks before. I've talked about him and his career. Yeah, and Gurgler. <laughs> <laughs> and this movie. <laughs> I think Dick it was Gurgler. I think it was his next movie after Grizzly, and a lot of people at the time mis- of the mistaken it for um, a sequel to to Grizzly. Right. You know, because I mean, a, a lot of the themes are the same, and you know, obviously, you get like you know, a, you know, bear attacks in in Day of the Animals. But that's what's great about this one is like, you know, if you like animal attack movies and you don't want to settle for just one animal, you get you, all you get of all them. of them. Yeah, in this. you do. Every animal gets a turn on those you humans. Get the spectrum, man. Yep. Yep. So it's pretty great. You know, uh, those dang campers just have to go up there. It's got your uh, my the only movie that I love with Leslie Nielsen in it. That's not true. He's so uh, rapey. Creep show. Oh, creep show. Yep. So two the two films. Yeah. No the the crazy uh, ozone atmosphere shir- turning the animals. It turns the human animals too, and he really goes bad fast. Yeah. It, that part is he's not a real cool. piece of shit. He See, is, y- you you so say you, you generally don't like Leslie Nielsen. I he's love like Leslie Nielsen, and I'm glad he found his niche with with comedy sure. in the latter half yeah. of his career. And I'm glad that made him practically a household name, you know. But I think one of the things he lost his path on along the ways in his world of comedy is that. The guy, his his physique and everything, and his demeanor, his comedy works best when he plays it straight. When he when he's like being goofy and shit, like Mister Magoo or Scary Movie Three, it's not funny anymore. It's kind of more sad. Um, when he's like doing silly faces or Pratt Falls or whatever, but you go back and watch like the original Airplane, and he is just stone cold serious through the whole thing, and he's saying the funniest fucking lines that are still quoted to this day, like. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. You know, everybody knows that line. Um, and that's when his comedy really works, because because when he wants to, he can play a he, freaking asshole. He acted his ass off. Oh, yeah. And it's because he was so good at being a good actor that we fucking hate him in this. He's a, yeah, he's a real son of a bitch. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, I gotta say that out of them all the movies that we watch, this is my favorite out of all of them. I this is because, like you said, it gets all the animals. Um, that I mean, it's not a perfect movie. There, there yeah. are spots where I'm just like, oh, really? <laughs> um, but I mean, it. I think it. It's seventies, man. Yes, it's yeah, 70s it, like, on and film. I love that. I, yes. I love that aesthetic. Oh. And it's just like it. I think it's. 
describes animals' reactions like perfectly, you know, because humans go in there and we we fuck up their natural habitat. And, you know, it's like, it'd be like somebody coming into our houses and saying, okay, well, uh, we got to get rid of all these goddamn Halloween posters. Uh, <laughs> and these kitchen cabinets fucking suck. They got to go. And just imagine somebody coming in there and just ripping your shit up, you know? I'd be like, I'd want to fuck you yeah. up too, you know? Um, but yeah, uh, just you you didn't just get one you know species of animals just attacking it's just you had birds cats coyotes snakes um bears yes exactly yeah. Yeah. i was sort of wondered how some of this was filmed like when those <laughs> ca- cats attack them or is it cats or coyotes when they're like i think both when they're like sleeping in the tents like one of the first nights like oh, yeah. that fucking look actually angry and they're uh, obviously real animals like you know yep yep the, the, the dumb ass to start to split up and that's where shit gets even worse yeah and it's definitely a, a message movie which I kind of like sometimes you know it kind of goes hand in hand a lot of times especially in yep, the 70s those, those hippies are making movies. movies and yeah <laughs> uh huh yeah I love it I mean it's a it's kind of weak maybe with those I don't know. It's before science really got going. <laughs> Just the, kidding. Like the part we're, that... Yeah, we're using hairspray and look what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, stop with the hairspray. Yeah, they were in and <laughs> they were at a higher elevation, I think. That was what their right, uh, uh, claim yeah. claim was. That's why it's a, it affected these animals more, but one of my favorite parts of the movie that just made me laugh my ass off is the guy says he gets pissed off at the girl at like this doorstep, you know, because he's trying to save her. He just goes, well, fine, be alone by yourself, you know, and he takes 10 steps and she starts crying. And then he's just like, oh, I'm sorry, I'll never leave you again. You know, when he found her out in the wild and she was probably doing better than he was, <laughs> it's just like, oh, OK, whatever. And yeah, I mean, I, I can say I can sum up I can sum up this movie for everybody in six words on how awesome this movie is shirtless leslie nielsen fights a bear <laughs> does he ever in the rain uh, in the rain yeah in the rain. is this the first he, time Eddie, for Eddie, yes this is my my first oh, time awesome I, yeah my, and i all, love all these are first times for me and i love the fact that leslie nielsen does not back down for the bear he's just like yeah come nope. get some bitch. he charges the bear <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i was gonna exactly. say at, this, at that point in the movie he's balls to the wall he does not give a fuck yeah unhinged he's, yeah he's, just like, <laughs> he's looking he's, for someone to fight yeah he's he's beating the shit out of that guy's that kid's mom he's manhandling that kid and yeah fucking yeah. throws him yeah yeah man he shot puts that fucking kid <laughs> you lily liver punk <laughs> <laughs> really? oh such a dick he plays a so good bad. bad guy yeah and he keeps calling that you know he's so he's so yeah. racist too yeah. he keeps calling that, oh God, that yeah native american kimo and just like <laughs> just wow. won't stop pushing just the whole oh day. yeah e- every stop oh. every time they take a break oh, what's he yeah. call him like hot shot or uh, oh yeah fuck yeah him. god damn <laughs> oh. frank drebin's a prick man. <laughs> yeah this movie's kind of great it's uh we saw it on Tubi, free on Tubi. Is that where I, we, I don't know. I have I have so. it on DVD. So. I think I do too. Oh. The media blasters and what's interesting. Oh, I forget the title now. But when you when you start to it had an alternate title. So when you watch the DVD, it pulls it pops up where you can watch it with that title instead of the Day of the Animals title. And I can't remember if there's like any other differences between the two versions, but. Yeah, I mean, I've always been a big fan of this movie. I'm a big William Girdler fan. Um, you know, if, if you remember from my Insane's pick, he had a very full career, but a very short career. I mean, he made nine movies in six years, but then like died in pre-production for his next film in a helicopter crash. So it's a bummer he didn't get to, you know, continue on making films because every i have i still have there's a few of his that i still haven't seen but 
I've seen over half of his filmography, and I love every single one of them. I really, I really like his stuff. Yeah, it just really made me want to watch Grizzly. Gosh dang, that movie's mm-hmm. awesome. And I think there's a either a Rift Tracks or an MST3K of this there one. There is, there is. But I know there's definitely one for Grizzly as well, which yep. is a really good one. Yep. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Tad? You haven't said too much on this one. No, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I think the time era, this was put in the 70s, the look, the feel, it felt feels real. You know, there's there's no replacing uh, real animals. The, you, you know, having the mm-hmm. real animals there rather than a CGI cat is mm-hmm. something else. And yeah, it just it's fun. Oh. It's sort of trashy, but it's it's cool. Oh, I'm just, I got so sad. I just thought about that little girl in the truck. Yeah. Holy crap, that's the saddest scene I've ever seen. Jesus, yeah. that was awful. Yeah. I'll be right back. Don't think, me- Oh, fuck. Think about the guy getting eaten I by know. a freaking rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> sure, him, but this no. poor girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's not getting bit, man. Yeah. He, uh, when, it, the, when they made this movie, they did some really, I think, interesting ways of shooting things with the re- with the yeah. fact that they're using real animals and you know obviously there's some stuff that they can't do but they've come up they ca- they did some really cool camera you know cool an- camera angles and editing to really really sell all yep. these animal attacks you know and there's some stuff that you know there's, there's some stuff of that happens off screen you know sure. you know the the amazing bear fight with Leslie shirtless <laughs> Leslie Nielsen doesn't happen for an extended period of time and his actual death is off camera but it's it's effective because you're getting that that death scream from him you you know you know he's dying at that moment from him just mad rage fighting a bear screaming <laughs> to like I am being now being devoured by this bear uh-huh. scream you know so i think one of my favorite shots is when they find that truck and it, the bed's full of rattlesnakes uh, and they're they're running away and it the camera angle is is low to the ground along the side of the truck and they're just dropping snakes into the frame as if the snakes are crawling out of the bed to, yeah. of the truck to trace that chase after them you know and it's just a simple effect of like here's the snake wrangler just off camera dropping snakes into the shot um it's coming after you. but it but it works you know you know exactly what's happening there you you know that these snakes are not just there and they're gonna bite them because they're there. No, the snakes are chase gonna chase them down. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Day of the Animals. Love, Love it. it. Yeah. So Tad, what's our next movie we're gonna talk about? Our final movie is Burning Bright. I'm starting a safari ranch. I need a scary animal. That's what the tourists pay to see. This cat, he's not scary. He's evil. Tough coastal warning to now in effect for all of the Gulf Coast. We're looking at a strong Category 3, so board up those windows. The emergency shelter's being set up in King County. In the middle of the night, an evil was brought to this house. Hello? The windows are boarded. Don't wake up! The doors are sealed. There's no way out. And it's appetite. Please, God, let there be a way out of this. It's relentless. So we save the best for last because this is a strange one. Um, I don't even know if I how to even read the premise. I'm looking at different pages. I mean, this real real life Tiger King, this sort of piece of shit stepdad, uh, steals savings from his stepdaughter who's taking care of her autistic brother to buy a fucking vicious tiger to start a, I don't park, some kind of animal park. 
Mm-hmm. Um, Safari thing, yeah. And then a fucking hurricane comes for some reason, and uh, this piece of shit closes both of them in a house, locks them in a house with the tiger during a hurricane, so they have no phone, no way to get out, and holy shit, man. Like, what a weird mashup of movies. Um, <laughs> it's a disaster mm-hmm. movie. It's an animal attacks movie. It's a moral story. It's a... Uh, it's all over the place. The tone of this one is so strange too. It's just like it, it, you, you really root for the girl and her brother, obviously. Yeah. Um, and you really, really hate th- this guy might be worse than Liam Neeson's character. Oh, yeah. uh, well, I was going to say here, uh, no, nah, I'll save it. I'll save it when I, my turn to talk. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm, I think uh, he definitely has to be. I mean, he locks a tiger in a house with a, uh, with an autistic kid. Um, but she is a badass sort of. She reminded me a lot of the, the girl in Crawl, where she's yeah. resourceful yeah. and smart. And uh, I know in that situation, I would just fucking let the thing eat me. Uh, I would, there's no way. I mean, she she just does some crazy stuff. They get they they pull Indiana Jones and jump in a freezer. Uh, you know, it's just it's wild. And and the poor kid clearly doesn't understand the scope of what's going on. And he has his uh, his quirks and his ticks, and he wants things to be to his routine while there's a tiger and she's incur- the most patient human alive. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. She, she's serving this kid breakfast the way he wants it while there's a fucking tiger in the house. Um, man, what a saint this, this woman is. I was like, I'm going to riot if she dies. Um, <laughs> luckily it ends in the way it should with the piece of shit getting his for what he's done mm-hmm. because we learned that he actually killed his wife. Um, and took the inheritance, and then he tried to kill the stepdaughter and the autistic kid, which is just really, really shitty. Um, and, and it's really heartbreaking because there's even a part where she has a dream where she tries to yeah, suffocate that up, yeah. her brother, yeah. and it's like, you know, I, I, that's a real thing. Like, you know, she's lived her whole life for him. Um, so, you know, as it's like, you can't really blame her. She's having these dreams, but, you know, she obviously loves the kid and takes care of him and but she is putting all of her life aside. You know, she's she's dropping out of college. She's trying yeah. to get him in there and doesn't have the money. And she's, you know, it's just it's it's heartbreaking on so many levels that when it finally gets to the end and that big payoff is is perfect. So uh, I, this was my favorite of the three. It was a really it really oh, wow, surprised really? me. Yeah, it really surprised me. I had no idea going in what this was about, and um, you know, I didn't watch trailers for anything. And and this one, like I said, was just sort of. It's like things that shouldn't work together. You know, whoever wrote hmm. this, whoever came up with this weird idea um, is I, I don't know if it's, you know, a lot of people probably don't wouldn't enjoy the tone of this, but I, I it really worked for me. Huh. OK. Awesome. Well, I'll just say um, this ended up being my least favorite of the three. Um, and it's it, it, it's a personal opinion thing. The to pull back the curtain a little bit, the reason why this topic was chosen is because I wanted to watch this movie in particular. It's been on my radar for a while. I need an excuse to watch it. I'm like, hey, we're gonna do a big cats movie, uh, big cats theme for the show, so I can watch Burning Bright. You know, and then you know, just the seeing the trailer and the premise obviously intrigued me. You know, it's like, oh, a tiger is loose in your house. This could be fun, and. Uh, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, was as much fun as I was hoping. Um, you know, there was, there was moments where I'm just kind of, just like, kind of got a little bored with the cat and mouse aspect of what was going on. And on a personal level, this is why I probably dislike the movie the most. It's not a reason to say it's a bad movie. Cause I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's just a personal opinion on why this movie doesn't work for me is that the guy playing the asshole is Garrett uh, Dillahunt. And ever since I watched the sitcom, he was on raising hope. Uh, yeah. I freaking love that guy. I think he is extremely talented. He's, he's done, you know, you usually see him in a lot of like serious roles and a lot of asshole roles actually, even yeah. um, I think he was in that um, army of the army of the dead. He had a small part in that. Um, and he was a jerk face in that one too. Um, um, but, and then the fact that he at one point did the sitcom for several years where he was freaking hilarious. He was my favorite part of that show. 
and with a show of a lot of amazingly talented, funny people. You know, got like Cloris Leachman on that show. You know, um, you got Martha Plimpton on that show, and and this guy who I've never seen before until this sitcom is the one that steals the show for me. You know, so his like comedy timing and his his mannerisms were just I think hysterical, and became a big fan of his. So that's why I wanted to watch this movie, and I feel like one. He was such an asshole. Like, you know, Leslie Nielsen in Day of the Animals, you love to hate him, you know, but this guy, I just hated hated him to hate him. Like, I, I hate, hate, hate. There's there's nothing inter- fun or entertaining about this bad guy character whatsoever. And I feel like the fact that I feel like this guy's extremely talented um, was highly underused. Like he just he wasn't even in the film that much, even though he's kind of a central character um to the story. Uh so yeah, I will say there are some things that I do like about the movie. Um my favorite scene, and I thought it was like out of all three movies that we watch for this, I think it's the best scene out of all three. Uh, is the scene where she is in that in the laundry room and the tiger's coming in. And she's crawling up that that laundry chute. I thought that uh-huh. was pretty suspenseful. But the best part is she's up there, and um, and the tiger doesn't know where she's at. And that like little bead of sweat hits the ground, and the tiger sees it and licks it, smells and it, yeah, smells it, licks it, whatever. And then and then just that that look, that POV from her looking down the laundry chute, and that tiger is just right underneath her. And that tiger looks up at her. He's like, I found you, bitch. Yeah, I thought that was <laughs> fucking awesome. That was a really, really cool shot, really cool it had, scene. It Super. had Halloween 5 vibes for me when Jamie oh, Lloyd's yeah. in the laundry shoot. And- oh, yeah. Yeah, but just that look up of the tiger, I just thought it was like creepy and suspenseful and like got my heart racing. Um, so that was one of the saving moments of this movie for me. That and um, meatloaf. I knew it. Yep. I enjoyed like all the all the things she tried to, uh, you know, to use to try to incapacitate this thing. It wasn't just like, okay, I'm going to stab this and kill it. I'm going to try to, you know, sh- you know, shoot it, you know, because and she did try those things, but she also tried to to drug it. Yeah, you know, because she the just pills was, in the meat. Yeah, yeah, and and leaving those little meat bombs, you know, wherever she could, and just to try to slow it down. And I can't um, decide. I can't decide if I liked those moments and the fact that they were utter fa- utter failures in her attempts to stop the tiger. Because yeah. that's that's thing. different. But at the same time, I'm like, we spent all this time showing us this for yeah, that didn't no pay reason. Off. Yeah. It didn't pay off. I mean, did that kid, the cat didn't hack it up or, you know, it did, it didn't like, you, you didn't see the cat just going, slowing down and, you know, be, getting all drowsy or anything. So, I mean, it didn't, I like the fact that they tried to use that, but I mean, they didn't have any payoff from it. Yeah. Um, I, I like the actress that, that was in this because mainly because she was in Dust Till Dawn, the series. She played uh, Seth yeah. Gecko's love interest. Uh, um, I think she was in like some of the Step Off movies too. Step Up movies, excuse me. Um, but yeah, I think Tad hit the nail on the head. I mean, this woman's a freaking saint, you know, for, <laughs> you know, yeah. all that she sacrificed, you know, for this for this kid and you know and you know i revert back to one of the one of the things where that the the asshole stepfather says just leave the kid with me you know and then you know going back on that and then watching the whole movie you just like if she would have left i mean that kid would have been dead within like a day or or two you know he just would have fed him to the fucking cat so uh yeah this guy's a real piece of fucking work so for me, I think, um, I mean, I liked it. It was okay. Um, uh, but I, I think this one for me has like the opposite effect of Uncaged, where uh, this one uses a real tiger, and I think that that's what hurts it for me is because 
because they had a real tiger for all of this, tigers, um, they had to film it in a different way where you almost never had them in the same room at the same time. All the shots were very either POV or, you know, lurking or from her or from the cat, never really a lot together. And like, so for me, they were, it was more drawn out just the way they shot it. That was my, my biggest trouble with the movie. I just, I thought the way they had to shoot it, you know, which is, I I wouldn't want to do that, but the way they had to shoot it to use the real tiger made, there was like a disconnect a little bit and made some of the shots seem a little more slow or disconnected. I I mean, but yeah, she, she was freaking awesome. Uh, The dude was a super jerk and, and meatloaf, man. How do you not? Meatloaf. I know. I thought it was a bit of a stretch on how to get the tiger like into the movie. Very convoluted plot, maybe. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I was so confused at the beginning. I'm like, so this guy, you know, he's arguing with the, the original tiger's owner, and he's like, you know, this tiger's really mean, and, and they're arguing back and forth. He's like, I want the meanest tiger. Like, who wants to come see the meanest tiger? Yeah. Oh, you're and trying to kill just, your family. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was just sort of like... A strange, I don't know, it's yeah. a strange way to shoehorn it in where he's like, I'm starting an animal park. Okay, do people just do that? I mean, I know we <laughs> just talk about Tiger King, but it's like, you can't just start one with one tiger, and he blew it all the money on that. And, and when he when she finds out, like, you know, she's trying to get him into some therapy or whatever, and it's like, oh, you know, that, that count doesn't have any money in it. Where'd it go? I bought a tiger. Like, what? <laughs> like once it's yeah. all revealed, it makes sense. But up, and, off up until then, it's like, this is more confusing than it probably needs to be. Right. Yeah. I hear you on that. Yeah. I don't know. I, the, here's, here's what I find really perplexing. Bur- burning bright. Right. Oh yeah. Well, what, that title just doesn't really make sense to me. It's, I think, oh, hold on. Is, I read is it like it? an autism sort of thing? No, or? I think it's like a line from like a poem or something that has to do with the tiger. Oh, hold on. It, it, uh, let me see if I can find it because I think it was in the IMDb trivia. Um, so nothing you could derive from watching the movie? Exactly. Yeah, it's <laughs> not connected to Dang. what happens in the In the middle of a fucking movie. hurricane. I mean, the sun ain't out, you know? Yeah. Um. <laughs> thing. Yeah, and that hurricane was just like uh, just a story, you know, plot just to keep them in the house, you know? Because, yep. I mean, they're not... And to board them up and, in it, yeah. Yeah. But apparently, you know, the, the, the stepdad can just go to a bar and drink and all the lights are on and, you know, no, electricity never goes out in the middle of this hurricane either, which I found a little weird. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, the title is a reference to the William Blake poem, The Tiger, spelled with a Y, published mm-hmm. in 1794. Well, of course, everybody knows that. Well, shit. <laughs> So Fuck. basically, it's just a title to be pretentious. Got it. Also, watch this one on Tubi. I think it's on Prime too, mm-hmm. but yeah. it's out there. You can watch it. 2010. Yep. Yeah, it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> the Sweet Tiger's in it. I've never the seen Tiger. Tiger King, so I don't really. Yeah, I know you've been smart enough to avoid it. I know. But now it's season two's it's... out. It's a, it is a guilty season pleasure. Season two, I thought I'm it was a lie. documentary that had an ending. I guess not. It is, but you know, if something <laughs> gets enough viewers, you just got to squeeze every drop out of it. Yeah, that's right. You got to ring that chamois for all it's worth. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna skip that one too. I'm gonna watch it. You will. I know. Sucker. You make me feel better about myself. <laughs> like at least I'm not any of these people. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. <laughs> but it, it'll, it'll put your shit into perspective exactly. real quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's it for our big cat talk. But that's not all. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, it will be segments time here on Attack of the Killer podcast. Before that, you're going to hear a promo for our podcast podcast network called the prescribed films podcast network 
The PFPM is the home to many shows. So many. So <laughs> it's like Are you keep... looking at my notes? Because that's literally that was my <laughs> next line. So many. What do you mean notes? Scripted? I mean what? what? No. This is off the top of my head. Including our newest addition. <laughs> <laughs> including our newest addition to the network genre exposure now genre exposure is a bi-weekly podcast plumbing the depths of genre films from old new cult and transgressive whatever that means join the hosts as they explore the wide world of cinema broadening all of our horizons one movie at a time dudes it's a great show it is a great show um to kind of you know add to that little description there, I feel like it's a show where each one of them comes with a different genre of film that the others are not familiar with. So it kind of maybe a little bit in the vein of your show, Ted, uh, first time, where the, the one host is exposing the other two to something Expo. new for the first time. So, But you can check them out in all of the shows on the network at thepfpn.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to the show, and it is time now for segments. We're going to start off by hearing from you guys, the listeners. Here's Jason with shout-outs. It's time for shout-outs! That's right. It's time for everybody's favorite segment, shout-outs. We asked, what are your favorite big cat Horror films. Okay, got me excited for Kit Kats now all of a sudden. Oh, yum. The big ones. Anyway, uh, so we got some cool responses over here on the Facebook page. We got attacker Brett Royer. Hey, Brett. He says, The Ghost in the Darkness. Oh, that is a good one. awesome. I saw and, that in the theater. Yeah. But I haven't seen it since. I need to revisit that. You probably saw this other one in the theater, too. Roar. No, but I wish I could. Oh, I know, man. I still I'm actually always... haven't even watched it yet. Dude! I know. You like Day of the Animals? You're going to love Roar. Because it's r- real? Because it, it's, <laughs> it's the most real of all. It really is kind of real. <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. All right, up next we got Don and Nelly. He says, the first choice here is Cat People and its remake, which should be quite obvious. Uninvited is incredibly fun with its goofy <laughs> charm. Uh, yeah. And the wild Night of a Thousand Cats is something to behold. Also worth bringing up is a Danish horror film called Cat, K A T, involving the spirit of a woman's possessive boyfriend inhabiting the body of her docile pet cat and using it as an instrument of destruction against any male that tries to woo her afterward. Before things get weird once she discovers what's happening. Yes, you read that right. And no spoilers for those of you who haven't seen it. But it's on YouTube last I checked. Well, you love cats as instruments of destruction, so. (laughs) Thanks, Don. Up next, we got the Reebster. Mike Reeb. Cat people. The original and the 80s versions. Yep. And Sleepwalkers is cheesy fun. Ooh, oh, man. There you go. Reeb, I knew you were cool. Cause Sleepwalkers is awesome. Here's the thing. I, I don't my line. want to poke a hole in Sleepwalkers as I know you love it. But, like, if they're en- if they're, they're kind of like cat people, right? Right. And But their enemies are cats? Mm-hmm. I don't get that. They're different races, species of cats. Oh. Yeah. I was... <laughs> There's no connection there. Okay, moving on. We got Tim Lennerer. Hey, Tim. He says, Roar. Yay. It's a cinema verite horror drama where verite, uh, horror, 
a drama where the cast and crew were regularly mauled by the actual lions, tigers, leopards, and other incredibly dangerous animals that were, for obvious reasons, not following the script. (laughs) There will never be another thesis self-destructing debacle like this film. I will always look back on its appearance at B-Fest with love because the rowdiest, cleverest, loudest audience since the 42nd Street Grindhouse is shut down was terrified and appalled into silence. Wow. Awesome. Then we got Jonathan from Twitch of the Death Nerve podcast. He says, Wild Beasts. <gasps> yes. That was tempting to put that on the list, too. Oh, but Jonathan likes it, so... It's got to be good. It's an Italian animal oh. attack movie. It's the Italian version of Day of the Animals, oh, really. Oh, man, why did we... Oh, it's got a two. scene where an elephant breaks through a wall. It's freaking amazing. Shit, yeah, let's watch that and roar at least in part two okay. of this. All right, then we got, oh, this one guy, Brian Clark. You know him. You love him. It's Brian Clark. I do love him. A lot of people, including most of the people who were in it, do not like the remake of Cat People. I rather dig it. The Bowie theme song is awesome. Ooh. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's just a got shout out for Brandy. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Tim says, I haven't seen the movie, but I love the hell out of the theme song. And up next, we got Brian J. Godzilla. Attacker Brian, he says. <laughs> he says, Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla is my favorite big cat movie. King Caesar is a fun addition to the Godzilla universe. I'll give you King Caesar, yeah. All right. Uh, Tony Miller, attacker Tony, the Tonester. He says, insert predictable comment here. Okay. (laughs) And then Brett chimes in, are there big cats in Twilight? You sons of bitches. (laughs) And we didn't have anyone on the Twitter or... Or on Instagram, but that's all right. A lot of great comments over on Facebook. But you can still leave us a comment by leaving us a voicemail. We'll read those, or we'll play. We'll, play those. we'll do lots of things to your voicemails. Just call and do it. You can call at 415-952-6857 or 415-95-AOTKP. Leave us that voicemail. Mail. Warf Merle, and we'll play it or read it or do things to it on the show. And that's shout outs. Yeah, Tony, I dare you oh. to leave a voicemail. Oh, called him out. Right. <laughs> Hi, this is Tony from my. Uh, where am I come from? Uh, uh, Brett and Tony with Ashlyn and Dave. Hi, oh, hey. Ashlyn. Hi, Dave. This is Brett. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta say your name. You gotta say your name. Okay, we'll call him because uh, Mike called me out, and I thought it would be the most predictable thing to uh, have my gang. Back me up on this. Yeah, yeah. We're here to back him up. And what? And we hold what movie? Uh, what are they talking about? Uh, we heard from a reliable source that the topic was going to be haunted butt plugs. Haunted butt plugs. So my favorite one, the haunted butt plug movie. Don't, was, there's a cat on my face. There's not enough lead. <laughs> there's not enough. Oh, that, that was one was good. good. One. That sounds painful. It yeah, was. You've never it was seen horrible that movie? to watch. Oh, I haven't seen it. Uh, I hope it was good. Yeah. Heard it was also good. All, all my resources led to some ghost pawns. I don't know, guys. What are you guys up to? <laughs> Anyways, thanks for having us on the show. Yeah, have a good show. Keep keep doing what you do, AOTKP. Yeah. Bye. But we're not done yet, folks. It's too bad. Christian Slater's, uh, he's overseas. He's working on a movie, so he can't join us today. But up next, we got Insane's Picks. <laughs> For this Insane's Picks Hall of Fame, we're going to discuss an actor who has played Captain Kirk. No, not William Shatner. No, not Chris (gasps) Pine. I'm talking about David Warbeck, of course. David Warbeck is a New Zealand-born actor that started out... Uh, a big time as a big time male model before getting into acting. Warbeck went pro following studies at London Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts during the 1970s, became and became a popular star of low budget genre pictures made in Italy, the U.S., and England. 
At one time, he was on the short list to be the next James Bond in Live or Let Die in 1973 until Roger Moore took the part. Uh, he later claimed he was paid by Eon Productions to be a substitute or backup Bond on the conditions that he not tell anyone that he would be ready for filming at a moment's notice in case Moore uh, left or threatened to leave the role. One day he read about Timothy Dalton being chosen and was told by the producers at that time that he was now too old for the role. His first step into Insane's Picks films was Trog in 1970, which was Joan Crawford's final film. Trog is about an uh, anthropologist who finds a live troglodyte in a cave and uses drugs and surgery to try to communicate with the primitive creature. In 1971, he was in the Hammer film Twins of Evil with Peter Cushing. Following that, he was in Duck You Sucker in 1971, directed by Sergio Leone, and Black Snake in 1973, directed by Russ Myers. He was also in Craze in 1974 and The Bonkers Black Cat in 1981, directed by Lucio Fulci. But in that same year in 1981, he was in another Lucio Fulci film, which is my all-time favorite Fulci film. That's right, The Beyond, also known as Seven Doors of Death. I love The Beyond. It is hands down so my good. favorite favorite Fulci film. Probably one of my top five favorite Italian horror films ever. So in 1982... However, he was in a movie called Panic, where he played, that's right, a captain, a cop, Captain Kirk. He was a cop trying to solve the murders caused by a monstrous man that is the result of scientist experiments with deadly bacteria. Fun fact, Panic was released as Zombie 4 in Greece. Another noteworthy film is... Uh, David did in the 80s was Ratman in 1988. Ratman is a story about two models uh, that are on a Caribbean island for a photo shoot. One night, one of them is found dead and her body seemed to be eaten by rats. The victim's sister, Terry, arrives on the island and is helped by a mysterious novel writer that he that she met at the airport and they start to investigate the murder. They stopped at an isolated house just to just to discover that the landlord is a scientist who created a ferocious mutant half ape, half rat, played played by Nelson D. La Rosa, uh, who was Marlon Brando's little person sidekick in Island of Doctor Moreau. Mm. I remember seeing bootlegs. Um, Ratman is really hard to track down. I have a bootleg DVD of it. And I don't know if it's ever had an actual release in the States, but if you can find this film, crazy. it's it's freaking crazy. Um, but I remember back in my bootlegging days in the late 80s, early 90s, trading tapes in the mail back and forth. And I'd have some tape trader friends that would always like throw on little fun nuggets at the end of their tapes, you know, usually like trailers of shit you've never seen before or heard of. And there was a Japanese uh, trailer for Ratman on one of those tapes. And just the image of this little guy, this like extremely little guy, you know, that was in Island Dr. Moreau, all done up with like, you know, dark makeup and with like this rat nose face and these claws and fangs just walking towards the camera. I found it utterly terrifying. Really, really creepy. So if you can find Rat Man, definitely check it out. It's worth a watch. It's kind of sleazy, but it's it's awesome. Warbeck made his final film appearance in Jake West's film. Razor Blade Smile in 1998. He died of cancer on July 23rd in 1997 in London, two weeks after recording the Beyond DVD commentary track. He was only 55 years old. Sadly for David, he never got his big breakout with James Bond, but lucky for us, we get all of his great work in genre in the genre we love so much. So for this Insane's Picks Hall of Fame, we induct David Warbeck. <laughs> And that is it for this episode of Attack of the Killer Podcast. I want to thank our very special guest, the Tiger King, for being on the show. Oh, he wasn't on the show. Uh, he's in prison. Anyway, 
Thanks everybody for listening. Uh, thanks also to the attackers for supporting the show and keeping the show going. It means a lot. And until next time, we'll talk to you on the next episode of Attack of the Killer Podcast. See you later. Oh no, could this be the end of? Attack of the Killer Podcast.